Chapter 10, Year of Trial It should be made clear at once that Gabriel was not perfect from the moment when he received the passionist habit. He was a youth of generous impulses and high ideals, but at this point he was no more than a saint in the making. Moreover, he was willing to learn, ready to accept direction, and this was of cardinal importance. St. Teresa acutely points out that, in quotes, an intelligent mind is simple and submissive because it sees its faults and allows itself to be guided, but a mind that is narrow and deficient never sees its faults, even when shown them, end quotes. At the start, Gabriel made a mistake, common to beginners, of relying too much upon externals and failing to realize the importance of the interior life. In quotes, when I undertook his spiritual direction, Father Norbert candidly confessed, I found him imperfect in two respects, in the surrender of his own will and his excessive attachment to certain private devotions with which he was overburdened, end quotes. Reduced to its simplest form, the task which confronted Gabriel was twofold. He had to effect a complete break with the past and mold the future in accordance with God's will. Basically, it is the everlasting paradox of the Christian life in its fullness, to die in order to live, to die to the world, to live for God. In quotes, He that finds his life shall lose it, said our Lord, and he that shall lose his life for me shall find it. From Matthew chapter 11, verse 39. St. Paul the Apostle had expressed the same fundamental truth when he wrote, You are dead, but your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. In the Passionist Rule, St. Paul the Cross had embodied this long spiritual tradition. With regard to training novices, his directions were clear and precise. He wanted each one tried in the practice of virtue, especially in humility, so that, in quotes, it may be clearly known whether he has a real love of being despised whether he be dead to himself and to the world in order to live only for God, in God and through God, willingly hiding his life in Christ, who for our sake chose to become the reproach of men and the outcast of the people, giving the most perfect example of all virtues. End quotes. Gabriel was only starting his religious life. He was but a novice, not yet bound by the vows of religion. This was his time of probation, his year of trial. It would not be an easy year. The system of training is specifically designed to test the spiritual, mental, moral, and physical fitness of the novice for the life which he has chosen. The new directions are given to the rule regarding the various tests to be imposed upon the novice. In quotes, let him be tried in the practice of humiliating acts. Let him wash the dishes, serve in the kitchen, sweep the house, and give proofs of Christian submission and patience. Let no distinction be made for any person, whatever may be his rank. Let one of noble family be proved by more strict and prolonged trial. In such a manner, however, that gentle charity and impartial prudence never be wanting. End quotes. Problems there were in plenty, especially in the early months, for it would be hard to imagine a greater contrast between Gabriel's new life and his former habits. In every respect, it was the antithesis of all that he had known, and even with an unlimited goodwill, the readjustment cannot have been easy. What had he been used to in Spoleto? His fashionable clothes had been the admiration of his little social circle, his fastidious grooming, his meticulous attention to the smallest detail of dress, his dismay if any spot or stain marred his appearance. All this was second nature to him. Now, a rough black habit replaced his former finery. The coarse woolen shirt chafed his delicate skin. His close-cropped head conformed to novitiate custom. The most menial tasks of the house were allotted to him as a matter of course. On hands and knees, he scrubbed floors and corridors. After meals, he took his turn to wash dirty dishes in the scullery. If lack of experience made him awkward at the unaccustomed tasks, correction was swift and often sharp. His room at home may have been simple, but it represented the height of luxury beside the Spartan austerity of his monastic cell. No soft pillows, no comfortable mattress wooed him to slumber. Like a soldier on active service, he threw himself down, still clothed in his habit, upon a hard palise of straw with a rough straw pillow, resting on three or four planks of unyielding wood. The plain furniture was the minimum permitted by a rule, a table, a chair, a crucifix, a few books, one or two pictures. Side by side with his corporal austerity went a healthy discipline of mind and spirit. The light novels, the romantic fiction, which had solaced his leisure hours in Spoleto, were replaced by spiritual books and the lives of the saints. The eager eyes of youth, once delighted by the stage and the theater, were now modestly cast down and governed by a stern code of mortification. His spontaneous wit, his effortless cheerfulness, 
his love for conversation had to be checked and restricted to the brief period of daily recreation. When corrected for a fault, he had to learn to hold his tongue, to kneel down and accept the rebuke in silence. His early resolutions reflect the inner struggle, the way in which he readjusted his mental outlook. The old pattern of life had to be smashed beyond repair, an entirely new pattern constructed upon entirely new principles. Resolutely, he set his hand to the task and promised himself, in quotes, to cut short immediately vain and idle thoughts, proud and haughty thoughts regarding honor, reputation, etc. And again, not to say a word that might gain me praise or increase my reputation, end quotes. During this year, Gabriel also composed a prayer for his personal use, a prayer which clearly mirrors his interior dispositions. It offers to a rewarding glimpse of the resolute spirit in which he sought to break with the past, to achieve self-conquest, and to correspond with the grace of his vocation. Although rather long, it is worth quoting in full. In quotes, O Lord, behold me here at thy feet to implore thy mercy and pardon. Wouldst thou suffer loss by granting me a great love for thee, deep humility, great purity of heart, of soul and body, true fraternal charity, great sorrow for having offended thee, and the grace never to offend thee again. Wouldst thou suffer loss by imparting to me the grace of thy assistance in all my thoughts, words, deeds, and penances, so that I may do all solely for love of thee, grace to give myself completely into the hands of thy dear mother Mary, grace of final perseverance in this religious institute, and finally the grace of a holy and happy death. I am but a poor beggar, seeking alms and showing my rags and sores, Behold my imperfection, my proud mind, my cold heart, so cold to love thee, so unmoved by sorrow for having offended thee. Behold my mind full of worldly thoughts, my perverse will inclined only to evil, my body rebellious against every good work. Help me, O my God, help me to amend my life. I beg this grace of thee through thy great goodness, through thy infinite mercy. To obtain it, I offer thee the merits of Jesus Christ, my Redeemer. My Lord, I am poor indeed, I have no merits of my own, but behold my merits. Vulnera tua merita mea, thy wounds are my merits. If for love of thee I had shed the blood which thy beloved son had shed for me, wouldst thou not grant me this grace? How much more wilt thou grant it to me when thy beloved son has shed his blood for me? Hast thou not promised in thy gospel to grant me all that I may ask of thee for the good of my soul? Ask, and you shall receive." Since this is so, thou canst not go back upon thy word. For this reason, I place all my trust in thee. Deign to hear me. I beseech thee, hear my prayer through thy infinite goodness, through the heart of the beloved Son, wounded for love of me, through the infinite love of the eternal Spirit, through the love thou bearest thy dear daughter Mary, and in honor of the whole heavenly court into which I beseech thee one day to receive me. Amen. End quotes. In his admirable biography of the saint, Professor Julia notes, that in substance, this prayer is not very different from the usual prayers found in devotional manuals, but perceptively continues, Reading these words, we feel much closer to him, because from them we perceive that he too was fully conscious of the seductive attractions of evil, but convinced as he was that any compromise with evil offends God, he put forth all his strength to conquer the weakness of human nature and to stand firm on that elevated plane worthy of his calling, that of a young man on his way to the altar." Since Gabriel was but human, one might perhaps expect him to look back with a certain amount of regret upon the good things of life, which he had so readily abandoned, or else one might imagine that such a complete reshaping of his life and outlook would be a very gradual process, extending over many weary months. Both of these views would be wide of the mark. The memory of the world that remained with him was not one that caused him to have any regrets at leaving it, rather, was it like the recollection of a nightmare which haunted him with scenes of terror and dismay. Even the most innocent reference to the past filled him with grief. If the novices happened to start talking of events in the world outside, Gabriel tried to turn the conversation to other topics. In quotes, Time spent in talking about things like that is so much time lost, he said. Better for us to keep close to God. It is quite useless to waste time in such talk, he said on another occasion, for after all what comes of it, even if it did no other harm, it might still cause us distraction in time of prayer. End quotes. In his new life, he frankly admitted that he enjoyed a happiness that he had never known before. Walking around the garden with another novice, Gabriel was one day talking about a religious vocation and what a great gift it was from God. Stopping suddenly, he pointed to the monastery and said empathetically, I was in many places in my time. I enjoyed all kinds of amusements, but never, no never, did I find what I have found here. End quotes. 
Only a month after his reception of the habit, his joy overflows in a letter to his father. He says, The joy and happiness which I find within these holy walls is almost indescribable when compared to the vain and frivolous amusements that I used to enjoy in the world. I assure you, Father dear, and the words come from my heart, I would not exchange a quarter of an hour spent with our dear mother Mary for a year or endless years spent amidst the pleasures and pastimes of the world. End quotes. Nor in his case was this transition of slow and gradual growth. It was effected with amazing speed. Scarcely had he crossed the threshold of the novitiate when his mind and outlook were completely changed. He had an absolute aversion for the world, wrote Canon Bonishia, a complete forgetting of things past, of home, of relatives, of friends. All was replaced by the love of God. The spirit of his vocation came upon him, not step by step or by degrees, but suddenly in all its fullness. End quotes. One tie with the past, however, could not be broken. This was now the tiniest link that bound him to his family. His father, in particular, continued to hope against hope that Gabriel might be deemed unsuitable to continue his novitiate on the score of ill health and would therefore soon return home. He honestly believed that his son's slight frame and delicate constitution was ill-fitted to withstand the rigor of passionless life. His understandable anxiety was increased by the fact that he was unable to visit Marvel to inform him of the situation. Repeatedly, Sante Vicente wrote to Gabriel imploring him to write more often, to give more detailed particulars about his health, and to return home at once if he felt unequal to the strain of the monastic life. The undercurrent of anxiety was clearly apparent, and Gabriel tried again and again to calm his father's fears. In quotes, you say I should write to you twice a month, but this just can't be done. It is not our custom to write letters as often as that. But don't worry, Father Master has assured me that despite our usual practice, if I need anything at all, or if I have anything special to tell you, he won't fail to give me leave to write. You can be quite sure that I am in the best of health, and if the need should arise, you can depend on me to write. End quotes. Despite this positive assurance, Sante Pacenti was far from satisfied. He kept up the constant stream of inquiries, and Gabriel, not without a touch of playful humor, repeatedly told him in almost every letter that all was well. Shortly before Christmas, 1856, he wrote again, in quotes, The kind of life I lead is so well arranged that I can honestly say the 24 hours of the day seem to me to be hardly 24 minutes. So quickly do they pass. This is a source of great consolation to me, for I know that this is not only the kind of life to which the Lord has called me, but it is also the very religious institute in which God has willed that I should spend the fewness of my days. I am in the very best of health and have even gained weight quite a lot. My life is full of happiness. I am living in the house of God, which is more than I deserve. I hope that with Mary's help, I shall advance on the path of perfection to the feet of Jesus crucified. What more could I wish for in this valley of tears? End quotes. The calm, reassuring tone of the letters gives little sign of his interior turmoil. He was torn between conflicting feelings. On the one hand was his deep and sincere affection for his father, and on the other was his firm resolve to be utterly detached from all family ties, from anything that could hinder his complete withdrawal from the world. When the time came for him to write home, he became emotionally disturbed and suffered acute mental anguish. If the choice were left in his own hands, he would not have written a line. But his exaggerated anxiety had to be checked and moderated. Out of consideration for his father, the master of novices told Gabriel to write home more often than was usual. This exception troubled him, and he was extremely reluctant to avail himself of the permission. Indeed, he must have tried his superior's patience by an endless stream of objections. Do the other novices do the same? He used to ask. Can you assure me that I shan't be held accountable to God for this? Will you take full responsibility for this if it is the smallest breach of rule? Will you take this on your own conscience? In much the same spirit, when letters arrived from home, Gabriel never showed any special wish to read them, any curiosity about their contents. He was loth to open his letters, and even when they were opened and handed to him, he would hardly glance at them. He excused himself with his usual plea. Are you sure that I shall have to answer to God for this? By way of compromise, the master of novices opened the letters and read them aloud for Gabriel. Even then, the fervent novice was not satisfied. He asked the priest to pass over anything he deemed superfluous and to give him only such news as was necessary. In this category, he included requests for prayers, for special intentions, or for the repose of the soul of recently deceased relatives and friends. In November 1856, he sent a letter of sympathy to his cousin, Peter Pacenti, who had suffered a double bereavement. In quotes, I was so very sorry to hear of the death of your good wife and her new baby. I had the news from my father, who was also deeply grieved. Our faith teaches us to be resigned to God's will, which allows all for our good. 
Certainly, it was a great blow, but what can be done about it? Should we allow such an occasion to pass without taking advantage of it for our salvation? No, indeed. Human nature suffers, but we must not give way to our feelings or allow ourselves to be overcome. We must turn to our Lord and make the sacrifice bravely for his sake. I shall fail to remember the deceased in my prayers. May we hope that she has already received from God the reward her virtuous life deserves. My remembrance to uncle and aunt and all at home. Tell them all that my life as a passionist is a sweet life, a peaceful life, a happy life. Oh, how good it is to serve God. During those early days, Gabriel, not content with practicing the ordinary penances imposed by rule, was inclined to go to extremes in corporal austerity. Father Norbert found it necessary to watch him closely in this respect for fear of unfortunate consequences. In quotes, I always noticed in him a strong inclination for bodily penance, so much so indeed that had I not carefully watched and restrained him, his fervor would have led him to undertake a great many austerities, quite beyond his strength. In a very short time, he would have ruined his health. I should add that my greatest difficulty in directing him was to keep him within bounds in the practice of penance. End quotes. Once Gabriel was taught that interior mortification, the control of the spirit, the mind, the emotions, was more important, he quickly put the lesson into practice. In dealing with the lives of the saints, there is a temptation to interpret facts in the light of after events. In Gabriel's life, the evidence of his contemporaries is therefore of special weight. Father Bernard Mary, who was with him in the novitiate, gives a careful and considered view of Gabriel's remarkable progress as it appeared at the time. In quotes, To have known the life he had led in the world, he says, and to consider him now a religious, from the start detached from all things, humble, obedient, reserved, and of extreme delicacy of conscience, was to be forced to the conclusion that he had at once taken in hand the reformation of his life in no ordinary spirit of mortification. Those who lived in familiar intercourse with him could not but recognize this fact. It is true that nothing unusual in the way of external penance calls for remark, but this was not from any lack of goodwill on his part, but because it had been forbidden him by obedience. He was especially diligent in interior mortification, and in this work he was truly happy. No one who had been acquainted with him in the world and knew him afterwards as a religious would have taken him for the same person. That vanity and levity, that impatience, that pride and irascibility, in a word, all those bad habits which had characterized him in the world vanished on his first entrance into religion and set free his beautiful natural character of which he made admirable use to weave for himself a crown of all the virtues. End quotes. As a rule, his inner struggle against himself was known only to his spiritual director. Outwardly, he always appeared happy and cheerful with a smile ever on his lips, making light of his own difficulties, sharing the burden of his companions. One such incident was vividly remembered by Brother Sylvester, a lay brother who suffered greatly during his novitiate from melancholy and chronic depression. Another novice tried to cheer him up, but his well-meant efforts were all in vain. Poor Brother Sylvester only became more depressed than before. Finally, his friend came to him one day with a solution of the difficulty. "'Cheer up, Brother Sylvester,' he said encouragingly. "'We'll tell the whole trouble to Frater Gabriel and get him to tell the Madonna about it. You just wait and see.' Our Blessed Lady will surely come to your assistance. No sooner said than done. When the two novices had explained the situation to Gabriel, he went to the choir to kneel in prayer before an altar dedicated to Our Lady of Holy Hope. Not for the first or last time, Mary heard and answered his petition. Some interior assurance must also have been given to him that she had done so. Later that day, Gabriel met Brother Sylvester and with his usual gentle smile, told him that everything would be all right in future. Brother, he said, our Lady of Holy Hope has obtained that favor for you. From that moment, his spiritual cloud was lifted and the brother was never troubled with it for the rest of his life. Denied the opportunities to practice more severe penances, Gabriel was ingenious in finding means to exercise himself in daily acts of self-denial. In his thoughts, the twin idols of prayer and mortification were closely linked. If we don't practice self-denial, we can't succeed at prayer, was one of his favorite sayings. He acknowledged, too, that the inspiration to practice little acts of self-denial often came to him in time of prayer. In quotes, The Lord often tells me, he said in a rare moment of self-revelation, Mortify yourself in this. Don't look at that. Don't speak of the other. Because these little things can hinder prayer. And if we are not mortified, we cannot succeed in prayer. End quotes. Small and simple these acts may have been, but in the aggregate, they represented continual awareness, real sacrifice, constant and undeviating self-control. Especially in the refectory during meals, 
did he discover ways and means for self-denial. He would deliberately wait a little before starting to eat. He would eat slowly and sparingly, leaving portion of his meager meal upon the plate. When finished, he concentrated his attention upon the book being read or became quietly absorbed in prayer. Yet all was done without drawing attention to himself. It was hardly noticed even by the most observant of his companions. In November 1856, Father Simon the Provincial arrived at Moravel to make the canonical visitation. Each novice was summoned in turn for an interview, Gabriel with the rest. No doubt the Provincial recalled the two letters he had written three months before, and again reviewed the checkered history of Gabriel's vocation. He was pleased to have Father Raphael's report upon his progress, which was corroborated by Father Norbert. The approach of Christmas afforded Gabriel the opportunity to give his father more details about his life. With Christmas greetings, he added further assurances, doubly welcome at such a time when the old man felt lonely for his absent son. In quotes, With regard to study, it is not allowed in any way except for an hour and a half a day. This is divided into an hour's explanation of Holy Scripture and half an hour's memorizing of the same. As to where I will be sent after profession, please God, nothing is certain. It can't be made definite until later, on account of study and the students. All I can say for sure is that it would be difficult for me to remain here. Since Advent has already started, I send in advance to you, to my brothers, and to all at home, my best wishes for a truly happy Christmas, once blessed by the infant Jesus and by his holy and immaculate mother. With regard to writing, you may be sure I'll write from time to time without fail. I don't want you to be worried on that account. End quotes. It is readily understandable that during the year of trial, not all novices persevere until profession. Some leave of their own accord, others are found unfit to continue, either for ill health or for other reasons. Such a one was Philip Calendrier, who has received the habit a week before Gabriel, but who left after six months. In the novitiate it is always a sad occasion when a vacant place is seen in choir and refectory, but this is the inevitable result of the winnowing process by which the better candidates are selected. It is the survival of the spiritual fittest. Perhaps on this or on a similar occasion, an indiscreet novice asked Gabriel a rather pointing question. In quotes, What would you do if the master of novices sent you home? There was no need for Gabriel to pause for reflection. His answer came immediately with utmost tranquility. In quotes, I would simply do God's will. Then he added calmly, There is no necessity to keep on thinking or worrying about the future or about what might happen. It's better to remain in God's hands, filled with trust in him. End quotes. That was his habitual outlook, and indeed one of his favorite expressions. Hope and trust in God sustained him in every trial, and especially when he was tempted, as he frequently was to discouragement. In quotes, If our salvation were in our own hands, he used to say, we would have cause to fear. But our salvation is in good hands, for it is in the hands of God, and in God we trust. End quotes.